which is uh, which is water and energy security through science and technology. Uh, I want to say I'm standing in for our chairman and convener, uh, Prof. Uh, Sipom Seleku, uh, who could not be here uh, to, today to chair this session because of other commitments. So I'm standing in for him. But before that, I would ask, uh, I want to go to Tanzania and ask um, Excellency Renalda Mlay to give us a prayer so that uh, we are blessed before we start our session. Your Excellency, uh, could you give us a prayer? Thank you so much, Your Excellency, Dr. Godfrey. Good evening, Excellencies. Good evening, uh, the program director, the speakers, and all that are attending this session. Let us pray before we start the session. Heavenly Father, we come before you in thanksgiving. We thank you for the day. You have given us a wonderful day, Lord. You have given us good health. And now we are convening here as your children to hear from the expert, to hear your word through this expert as we discuss the water and the technology. We all know that water is life and you gave us water and plenty of water so that we could use it for our lives and for all the creatures that you have made. Lord Father, bless the program director, bless the panelists, and bless those who are making this uh, session successful. And let us hear your word through the Holy Spirit and let us be your children and take everything that we have and use all that you have created for us for your glory and in Jesus' name we pray through your son Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency Renalda, for this prayer, which uh, gives us, which puts us in the Lord. Yeah. So my name is uh, Godfrey Dandawa, uh, who is standing in for the chairman, like I said already. I am the global executive in GBR, responsible for science and technology, as well as the education and intellectual development. I am superintend over two sectors. So today uh, it is interesting because uh, one of the sectors, science and technology, is being covered here on water and energy. Uh, but before uh, we get into our uh, today's uh, presentation, I would ask. Uh, the technical team to give us the GBR video so that uh, those people that are, are new to this session will get to understand what GBR is. So the introduction video would assist us in that. Technical team, could we kindly have the GBR video? The Global Business Roundtable has a God-given mission to focus on the holistic development of people in line with God's plan for His Kingdom. The aim of the organization is to help members to grow spiritually, intellectually, to grow their networks and to participate in trade and investment opportunities, to also participate in mentorship and coaching programs and to expand their businesses. Our organization focuses on the holistic development of its members and invests its time and resources in developing people in key sectors, including the spiritual growth and development, which is critical to ensure and to foster strong moral values and, uh, and ethics, which we want to inculcate in all our leaders and standards so that we could contribute to the uh, production of a new breed of leaders that will shape and transform Africa and the rest of the globe. Since its launch in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2009, the Global Business Roundtable has impacted thousands of lives around the world. Ten years after its launch, this God-focused organization has a presence in more than 80 countries in the following regions. The Southern African Development Community, East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, North Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. GBR has strategic initiatives, programs, and platforms that facilitate growth and opportunities for its members. This is done through the global and local events such as World Congress, Prayer Camp, and the Thought Leaders Summit, Women of Character Summit, Future Leaders Summit, Trade and Investment Exhibitions and GBR Sessions. 
These events create an environment for our members and partners to meet, interact, and create relationships that will develop their businesses and lives holistically. GBR also has a TV show called A New Thing, which seeks to educate, inform, challenge, empower, and inspire one to live their best lives in line with God's purpose by bringing in several experts from various fields and sectors together. The Global Business Roundtable believes that informed and engaged leaders can make a positive change in the world. The GBR Academy was established primarily to address leadership capacity within the Global Business Roundtable leadership structures. The GBR platform is an online system that exists to create opportunities for personal and professional development. It is poised to further facilitate trade and investment opportunities across nations and industries for big business. For more information on our organization, please visit www.globalbusinessroundtable.com or contact us on plus 2711-242-8000. Thank you very much, uh, technical team, for our GBR video. It gives um, us insight as to uh, what activities happen uh, at GBR. So you realize today we have a, a very good topic uh, which covers on water and energy security through science and technology. You will all agree with me that um, without water, we can't live. There is actually a saying that says water is life. Uh, without energy, we can't live. Food security uh, comes um, because we have energy and water. Uh, we have a very powerful uh, panel today uh, where I have three uh, panelists that I will introduce, uh, give you a uh, bios as we as they speak. Um, so our first um, speaker is Dr. Cesar Lopez, uh, who is from uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, Dr. Cesar Lopez is a native of the Dominican Republic. He graduated from Texas A&M in soil and plant sciences in 1971. Master of Science in Soil Microbiology from Peril View A&M, Texas, 1974. And PhD from North Carolina State University in Soil Fertility and Management. 1979. The field work for the PhD program he studied was done in Amazon jungle of Peru, uh, which specialized in shifting cultivation. He worked for the Ministry of Agriculture of the Dominican Republic as Agriculture Research Director, 1971 to nine, 1978 to 1984. After uh, visiting um, Organic Agriculture Production Systems in Europe in 1981, Dr. Cesar became convinced of the benefits of agroecological methods for health, food, and protection of water quality and biodiversity, adopting agroecological methods for soil and water management practices as a rural development strategy, since it was easier to implement for small farmers and water management for small farmers and more competitive, reducing soil and water degradation. In Dominican Republic, he worked to establish several rural non-governmental organizations, such as the Rural Development Group, GRAN, and Floresta uh, Incorporation, and was responsible for developing and being the first dean of the Rural Development School of the Université Nacional Evangelica the only university level college in DR teaching agroecology. At present, he has been developing an agroecological farm, producing agroforestry system based on shaded organic cocoa with a wide diversity, such as coconuts, plantains, breadfruit, passion fruit, lemons, saw, orange, cassava, yams, pumpkin, and a varied horticultural crops using many water and soil conservation practices, such as contour ditches, bio-intensive beds, and holes with biodiverse cover crops, making compost and earth humus, 
as well as using amendments such as biochar, ashes, bone and blood mules, lime, gypsum, and others, which are giving excellent results in this project. Uh, Dr. Lopez, I give you uh, your 20 minutes uh, start now to interact, uh, to give us your presentation. Uh, you, you may start your excellency. Uh, you, you are muted, your, your, your Excellency. Could you kindly unmute? Okay. Now, now, can you hear me now? Hola, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Hola. sure, we can, we can hear okay. you now. Uh, okay, you may proceed. Thank you. Well, uh, I was saying that I really uh, feel as a pleasure and, and a big opportunity to share my experience in food security in spite of all these crises that have uh, affected uh, the, the food production since in the last 70 or 100 years. Because uh, as a Christian, uh, as a young, I studied agriculture and I was always in my mind, uh, had the idea of what we find in the creation of, in Genesis, is 250 that gives us the big responsibility of managing creation. It says in in this verse, uh, God put man in the in the garden to produce and keep it. It's interesting because I was at least close to 30, uh, 3,000 years ago that 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 uh, statement is there. And it was in 1984 that United Nations uh, assigned a committee for developing the concept of sustainability that is so much used lately. But what is, and in 1986, two years later, this commission was headed by Ms. Uh, Brundtland, who was at the time prize minister Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, define sustainability, sustainable development, and everything that is sustainable. I using the resource without destroying it. Actually, with the ideally with improving it. So, actually, we see a relationship with what it says in Genesis two fifteen: use the resource, but don't destroy it. Keep it. Unfortunately, we have not complied with that, with so many other aspects of life, <laughs> socially, economically, we, we have had problems with this. And the agriculture, as you hear, I, I come from the training in agriculture of the mo some of the most important uh, universities, but I never was taught the importance of this part, keeping, using the resource and keep it, keeping it. And it results that what I was doing most of my life, even as guiding research for the Dominican Republic, uh, we didn't, we, our goal was always to do whatever management of the soil and the agriculture system so that we can get the highest yield possible. Sometimes even not necessarily economically profitable. But unfortunately, it was never measured what happened with the inputs or the that we use once we get a higher yield and what happens with those inputs once they leave the farm. And it happens that we get most of those chemicals that produce higher yield impacting the water, even the groundwater or the, the, the surface water with uh, these chemicals causing problems, lowering biodiversity. And I was never taught how important it was biodiversity for good, healthy food production. And unfortunately, in the last 30 or 40 years, we have seen an increase of diseases that when I was young, uh, I never knew or much about it. Some people, few people here and there 
I knew they had cancer. I never remember having people uh, allergic to, to, to flour or to never uh, sugar problems. And unfortunately today, this is so common. Everybody, I mean, the, the amount of money families are paying for healthy life is incredible. And most of these problems are now we know for sure scientifically that are related to uh, how the produce the food is produced. We only we not only impact water, air, uh, but this this some of these chemicals remain in the food we we eat, and they change our what is called the bio bio. Uh, microorganism population of our guts, and that causes a change. Obesity is related to this problem and many other things. But I don't want to get a lot on in that aspect, but just to understand that then uh, I had this opportunity being uh, director of research in 1981. I had the opportunity to visit Europe, like it was said. And I I thought I knew everything that had to be known and how to produce much, uh, a lot higher yield. But there I saw high yield without using these chemicals, organic agriculture. Well, eventually uh, when we returned, we, there were six Dominicans that we went together. We visited England. There is a college in south of uh, London and Sussex called uh, Emerson College. And in uh, Holland, we visited uh, the Wageningen University of Wageningen. And in, G in Germany, near Frankfurt, a noble farm, uh, organic uh, farm, uh, Dottenfelde Hof. And it was so amazing to me that you could produce eight, 10 uh, thousand, I mean, tons, eight, 10 tons per hectare of grains with no chemicals, no fertilizer. Well, and actually this system of organic is so complicated because if you have to certify, you will have to, to do a lot of things that normally farmers, small farmers that produce between 70 and 80% of the food we eat uh, don't use many uh, chemicals because they don't have the, re the financial resources. But when we came back to the Dominican Republic, we started an organic agriculture school and we started practicing this methodology. Well, eventually I myself became a farmer. And I have a, a video there that I don't know if uh, we can see now that without any, in very poor soil, low, high acidity, very poor internal drainage and no fertility. Uh, and yet we, we were able recycling biomass and using all these amend natural amendments uh, like charcoal, like biochar, very small particle of, of wood char, uh, coal, and uh, animal uh, uh, manure and so on and develop this capacity to produce a lot. I, I don't know, I was told that there was a person that could uh, put the, the video that we had. I don't know if we, we could have it now, if there is anybody that can help us in there. Anyways, today, uh, all this technology that I used to, to, to okay, here is, let's, let's watch the video. Okay, let's see if, if I can, cont can control it. This is uh, in my farm. Uh, uh, can we start it? And maybe, can you see that in the screen, this? Uh, okay, let's see. Some problem with technology. But the, the interesting thing now with this experience is that we can produce a lot of vegetables in, in very hot, humid 
tropical area. We are about 18, degree, 18 degrees north of the equator in the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic and the Hispaniola Island with same island with Haiti. And uh, it's hot most of the time. It's very seldom between, uh, let's say November to March that we can get maybe temperature 23, 22, but except in high mountains, it's not, uh, it's always hot. So now we have this experience with just managing. And then we have also sir, done, done some research and see that of these chemicals applied in uh, industrialized agriculture, the crops only take up maybe 10, 15, at maximum 25% of the applied nutrients. Most of these nutrients go into the water system and eventually to the Caribbean Sea or the Atlantic Ocean, depending on what side of the island you are. And the, the pest problem and the weed problem, we, if we have biodiversity, this principle of agroecology, uh, okay, here we go. You can see uh, the beauty of this farm, of these plots, where we have uh, all kinds of crop, crop uh, lettuce, cabbage, uh, onions, uh, tomatoes, and we also have, as you can see in the background, we have, it's a cocoa farm, organic cocoa farm. We have plantains, all kinds of food and, and vegetables in this uh, uh, small, the vegetable is only maybe one fourth of a hectare uh, that we have uh, the vegetable. Most of the farm, which is about uh, maybe 10 hectares uh, is cocoa, lemons, plantains, cassava, yams, we, we produce. And this farm, as you will see in a while, well, you see the productivity and we don't use any chemical except some for insects, some spray of garlic and onion and some plant extract. For fertilizer, we use manure of cow manure or, or fertilizer made out of uh, earthworms. And we also uh, see the, the combination of the, we don't use monocultural crop because that's, that's what brings pest problems. If you intercrop different, uh, see this is breadfruit as this plant that is uh, going there is breadfruit. But you can see in this particular part of the farm, we have a lot of stones that we cannot even get out of there, so we cannot plow. We cannot go in with us complicated. Immediately, the, the, you can see the, the big size of the sum of the stones, but you can with machete, picks, and uh, simple tools, you can make these beds that are about 50 centimeter beds and plant uh, inter, intercropped uh, vegetables with very, very good, equal or more yield than, than conventional. Of course, as you can see, this is open field. If we had some plastic on top, because this area gets a lot of rain, then we will probably have higher yield. And in the background, you can see the, 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 the breadfruit trees and the, well, the tropical environment, as you can see many, many areas. And so, uh, this is a, a, a event based on water and energy. We have very low energy inputs in this because we don't, do, we don't use any imported, which makes pr crop production, especially food crop production, very expensive. We use only local recycling of biomass that is always available in, in the tropics and also uh, there are these principles of agroforestry that organic matter that when you, is ignored practically in conventional agriculture or industrial agriculture, it's, a, it's like a sponge. The one gram of humus, organic matter, uh, can hold 
eight grams of water in the soil. So when you, we dip the soil, which normally has a, a layer with a high organic matter of 10 or 15 centimeters, we, we make it three times deeper when we go 45 or 50 minute, centimeters. And we do this with a tool, simple tools like machetes, uh, picks and, and so on. And then we add these organic materials in the bottom of this, of this ditch and, and put back the soil and we can produce uh, very, and, and by doing this management of the soil, this whole volume of 50 centimeter by one meter on, on top becomes a sponge. When it rains, instead of running off, uh, the, the water infiltrates and is, is, uh, stays in the, in the area where the roots are going to develop. And therefore, in drought situation, we don't get uh, uh, debt. The certification can really be controlled by this kind of practices, soil management practices. Of course, we use some, some amendment like this charcoal, fine pieces, uh, pieces of charcoal will has a lot of internal surfaces that retain water and nutrients also, instead of washing off, and the groundwater or the surface runoff water, we get more than 50% of the water infiltrating and staying in the layer of the soil that can uh, be uh, controlled by the, by the crops. Well, <laughs> I know this is a limited time uh, uh, event, but I can testify to you that we can produce food crops or any kind of crop with the resources that we have in any, any environment. Even in dry areas, we can have uh, amendments that are like lime and these uh, residues or uh, processed residues of, of animal blood and bones and also legumes. This biodiversity principle, the having a lot of different crops uh, and it, uh, maintaining the natural diversification of, of the flora and animals will, uh, is the health, produces the healthy environment for crop production and you don't have to use uh, terrible chemicals that cause uh, terrible diseases. Only uh, some plants can be used also, as I said, for deterrent of, of insect that will give some bad smell that they don't like, but it's, it's a, a very interesting and simple and cheap way of, of trapping water in the, in the farm and also making resilience to drought and even, and even to, to floods because organic matter helps to structure the soil uh, particles in, in, in structures that will leave air and water, excess air and water drain. So after a big, big rain, of course, if it is extremely big, like we have in the Caribbean, some hurricanes, then it, it uh, is complicated. But normal big rains that cause flooding will not be damaging your farm because it drains and, and goes to the groundwater. Okay, I'm going to leave it here because of the other participant, but that if, if there is time for questioning, and we hope that we can collaborate with your program in training and, and solving some of this, or sharing this experience. And I can assure you, we don't have to go hungry. And we are looking forward to share this experience with Haiti, which also we have uh, in the same island. And, and even though there is a big, Pro political problems there, but we have some uh, trained uh, students from Haiti that we are collaborating to, to promote these practices there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lopez, for this powerful presentation, um, which gives us an insight of uh, the great work that you are doing out there in Dominican Republic and the scientific method that you are using in biodiversity and agroecological um, sciences, uh, producing food, uh, which enhances food security actually without the use of uh, using organic methods.
without using uh, chemi chemicals. Um, the methods that you are using also are giving, you use low energy uh, input uh, exactly. there. Uh, it's, uh, I, I was very um, um, moved by the uh, method, the procedure that you, you, pre you present to us of how what the infiltration of water, which then uh, leads to conservation and preservation of, of, of water. And the method that you, you, you presented also, uh, simple scientific methods uh, that uh, mitigate against uh, droughts so that we are able to produce food. I am hopeful that if these methods are applied in many areas, as you will see with climate change, uh, most uh, countries are facing droughts and this method will, would actually enhance food production and food security. Uh, it is quite appreciated. Definitely would want to collaborate uh, with you in many ways to actually implement these methods and explore many other research areas that would assist countries to uh, have food, uh, to be food secure. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have a question and answer Thank segment. Uh, I hope you'll be there so that you know people can interact with you, get to ask yes. questions. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Excellency uh, Dr. Lopez for this powerful presentation. As we move uh, forward to our next uh, presenter. Um, our next presenter is Excellency uh, Ms. Sagarika Sahu from United Arab Emirates. Uh, Excellency Sagarika's career has spanned across uh, investment consulting, new market entry strategy, event curation and management, market research, media and advertising, marketing and corporate communication, investment and trade, business consultancy, event, travel, finance, fashion and advertising industry, and the United Arab Emirates semi-government establishments. Excellency Sagarika is an award-winning serial entrepreneur, international business strategist, mice expert and event solution provider, who founded Commerce Connect in year 2014, specializing in developing and assisting government entities and business houses in the high growth markets of the Middle East, Africa, and Indian subcontinent. Excellence Sagarika is able to strategize events from enterprise perspective while being cognizant of the challenges and opportunities typical of the region. Her educational background includes a postgraduate diploma in advertising and public relations uh, from Symbiosis Institute of Business Management uh, in Pune, India, postgraduate diploma in foreign trade from Symbiosis Institute of Management Studies, Pune, India, Bachelor of Commerce Accountants Honors degree from Utical University in India. Her work a role includes to be founder and managing director of Commerce Connect, founder and managing director of Commerce Connect Event Exhibition and Management, founder of Women's Expo, United Arab Emirates Ambassador and Board Member, Ghana Indian Trade Advisory a Chamber. Her past experience is Global Director Event and Content Management uh, for GEC Media Group, Acting Coordinator Trade and Investment Policy Commission, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, UAE Chapter, Business Development Consultant, Smart HR Consultants, and Office Manager, for destinations of the world. Your Excellency Sagarika, your 15 minutes uh, starts now. Thank you so much for the uh, kind introductions. I'll just put my presentation on, yes. <clears throat> okay. Welcome everyone to this call today. And I am the Managing Director of Commerce Connect. What we do in our company is we connect visions and we connect achievements across the globe, especially in the high growth markets of Middle East, Africa, and the Indian subcontinent. So what is today's topic? My, this is a very, very interesting slide for me. The security of the people and the nations rest on four pillars, 
food, energy, water, and climate. And these all are very closely related. And I'm sure all of you all will agree where the answer lies. The answer lies today. Oh, I don't know what happened. The answer is with mankind, with each one of us on this call today who control science and technology. Today, I welcome all the Global Business Roundtable members and we thank the organizing committee for creating a wonderful session around water and energy security through science and technology breakthroughs. And I'm here to talk about what we do in the United Arab Emirates. And I would basically like to concentrate more on the energy side of the whole presentation. So what is the United Arab Emirates energy strategy? They have created a uh, strategy for 2050, which we have scored 21 in energy security and 14 in energy equity and 116 in environment sustainability. How this was happening? This happens with all the people coming together as well as the government putting in initiatives across the globe, across the spectrum into different sectors. I don't know, this is going backwards, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so what does the energy uh, strategy entitled? In 2017, we launched this as the first unified strategy in the country based on the supply and the demand that was found with a lot of market research, qualitative and both quantitative uh, research being done, as well as the contribution towards the total energy mix. So if you actually see 25% to 50% of the total energy, would they are aiming to increase it for clean energy. And we want to reduce the carbon footprint in this country by 70%, the saving 700 billion by 2050. And this has already started off very successfully as I take you through the plans because this was decided in 2017. It also seeks to increase consumption and energy of individuals and corporates by 40%. So what is it uh, in, uh, in the UAE strategy, Dubai clean energy strategy as launched in November, 2015. <coughs> we are producing 75% of its energy by clean resources by 2050. And this also makes it the center of clean energy and green economy. The five main pillars that we are considering in this is infrastructure, definitely the legislation coming into place, good funding and building capacities and skills and environmental friendly energy mix. So these are the few rene energy, <clears throat> renewable energy projects that's happening in our country. So one of the main projects that I love to talk about is the Al Dafar solar project. This solar project is very is uh, uh, is in is a pilot project that is taking place, and once it's fully operational, this this aims to reduce the carbon emissions over by 2.4 million tons, and all these projects have a lot of uh, smaller projects attached to it. And any of you all want to know more details of any of these projects, please feel free to reach out. And uh, also the Noor Energy project also is into solar. And what we are doing is the Hatha wind project, which is going to take off, is also got a very, very good capacity because it's a part of the Mohammed bin Rashid the solar park here. And we also are supporting the Saudi Arabia and Oman with their renewable energy projects. So I wanted to talk a few on the projects that are available now. In wind, if you actually go to see, we have the Mazdar uh, company, which is the country's first wind turbulent uh, to generate electricity on the Sir Banyas Island. The Sir Banyas Island is outskirts of Abu Dhabi, 35 kilometers away from there. And this plant will have a capacity to produce around 850 kilowatts of uh, energy per hour. In the solar sector, we have the Shams uh, One station in Abu Dhabi. This plant produces about 70% of the total energy that is needed by Abu Dhabi. And Mohammed bin Rashid, the uh, uh, Al Maktoum solar plant, is the largest single site concentrated solar plant in the world. By 2030, we're expecting this project to produce around 5,000 megawatts of electricity. So this, if you, it's, in, it's located outskirts of Dubai, but it's within the, uh, within the country here. Also in nuclear, <coughs> the Baraka nuclear energy plant in Abu Dhabi is on, also on its way to economic development. Hydro is something that this country does not have 
because our water is only 10% is natural water and the 90% of it is desalinated water. But the projects that are going on in desalinization is also I'll take you through once we go a little ahead in the presentation. What the country has done beautifully is created zones. So we have the Dubai Sustainable City, we have Dubai South, we have Dubai Silicon Oasis, we have Mazdar in Abu Dhabi. These zones help in creating good projects which have sustainable, uh, welcoming sustainable companies as well as governments to come and have projects out there. <coughs> but I must say, my favorite is the Dubai Sky, Skyport transportation system. And that is for futuristic travel. And those, yes, we're talking about flying cars over here, which is already in the making. And that will move ahead where science and technology will actually talk about how we can actually use the flying cars. Now, when we finish off with energy, water security also plays a very important role as uh, rightly uh, pointed out. So what this strategy does is that it creates, it uh, points out into three different factors. First is the controlling of the demand. That is the water demand management program. We have something for the supply side of it. And that is the water supply management program. So to balance them off, there's also an emergency production and distribution program. So when you concentrate on three programs, when the demand and supply is mixed together, you obviously will have a, a good sustainable project out there. And this also uh, helps with uh, creating a lot of water conservation programs with our Deva, with Sreha and all of them, creating programs for people to know what all they can conserve, how, how and what how they can conserve water in, uh, in this country. Also, there's a lot of use of advanced technologies like if uh, there is a leakage in my water here, I automatically get a message from Deva stating that, you know, there is a leakage, please check because your consumption has gone up by 10%, 15%. And we actually get this as, as WhatsApp messages out here. <coughs> so how are they doing this? So what they want to do is reduce the total demand of water resources by 21%. And these all are statistics that are found uh, over time, because when this, the 2036 is given a deadline and uh, they want to work towards water first and 2050 is towards the energy. And this is a few pointers. If you all want to, anybody wants more discussions on this, I'm more than happy to discuss it. And what they want to do is that they want to ensure that per person water usage is drastically reduced so that we can be used in different forms. As I mentioned to you, we have a lot of desalinization water of the sea that gets used. And there's a lot of usage of treated water. The treated water is used for our agriculture and for creating the fauna and flora of this country. What are the main uh, water desalination projects? One of the main ones <coughs> is the Gantu desalization pilot plant. This is just a pilot program that they have started right now. And the technology that they're using right now is solar power desalization and reverse osmosis membranes. So they are creating technology, which will be important to do these projects in a long and sustainable manner. Apart from the above, as I mentioned to you, uh, Deva. Deva is the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority and Francisco increase the water security by expanding its water infrastructure. And they're doing new des desalization technologies and bringing about uh, a change over here. <coughs> so how do we get to know about all these technologies, et cetera? I uh, run the Middle East Startup Awards, which is into innovation and tech uh, related companies in the complete Middle East. So when I say Middle East, we talk about the GCC countries, Israel, Lebanon, and uh, Jordan. And uh, this uh, particular awards is presented by the patronage of the Ministry of Economy supported by the Dubai uh, Abu Dhabi global uh, markets, along with the angel investors. And then we have our other partners. So what the Middle East Startup Awards does is we encourage tech related projects in agri tech, health tech, uh, solar, and all the different projects to come forth of uh, people who are creating new technologies in the region. And uh, if anybody wants further information, please feel free to reach out. Apart from this, I also own the Women's Expo. Now, Women's Expo is a movement which is designed to transform businesses and entrepreneurs who are already impact creators into impact multipliers. So in this particular event, we use SDG goals, 
to create a stronger and a better sustainable society. And this is what my company is all about. Uh, we launched in 2014, as I rightly mentioned earlier, and I have different verticals under my business. And we are spread into 30 countries and we already operate in all these countries for the last eight years. And we also support uh, projects that are across the globe. And that's me, I'm a global connector. I'm an international business strategist and an event expert. And I want to be the change that I want to see in this world and be a part of movements that are doing that. Thank you. If anyone wants to connect with me, please feel free. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for uh, the rich uh, presentation that you gave us there. Uh, very rich, definitely we will need to connect there. Uh, very Thank great you. work happening in the uh, United Arab Emirates there. I like the strategy, the energy strategy there and uh, what it needs to achieve, uh, the objectives that it needs to achieve there in um, energy and use the fusion of science and technology. Then the, the water and security strategy 20, 2036, uh, using technology, the use of technology in the management of, of water systems. That's very you know, innovative. Uh, you spoke about the water desalination uh, projects that are happening there. No hydro, uh, no use of hydro in the uh, United Arab Emirates, but uh, there is wind energy, solar energy, and nuclear energy. That's true. Uh, very great work happening there. Thank you so much. Um, I hope uh, you will be available for the question and answer uh, segment and definitely reach out you know, to get to understand more uh, of these projects that are happening there and then see how best uh, as GBR we can use uh, that experience you know, to uh, help um, the, the globe, in, in, especially Africa that is lagging behind in terms of uh, you know, uh, the wind, um, solar and nuclear energy. You realize that there is serious challenges um, in Africa with energy, with most yeah. countries uh, going on, you know, on um, it's always uh, um, load shedding, load shedding. We have more hours of load shedding than the hours that we have uh, power. Hence, we should be using technology, science and technology to make sure that we benefit uh, from wind uh, energy, solar energy, as well as nuclear energy. Thank you so much for the very sweet and short uh, presentation, but uh, you know, covering quite some salient issues um, of, of uh, importance in the presentation. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have you on the question and answer segment. Sure. Uh, we move on to our uh, last um, panelist, who is Dr. Mubarak Afeku from Morocco. Uh, Dr. Mubarak is the Vice President, World Peace Committee in Africa. He is an ambassador uh, of large international human rights organization and chairman of IHRO in uh, Meg Arab countries. He is also a Vice President of the World Peace Committee 202 countries. He is the Director of Arab and Islamic Studies, Head of Committee for Arab Studies, Bait Narin um, Mesopotamia Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Mbarak is also the first Vice President of African Agency for Cooperation and Development. He is also the Chairman of Superior Council of IOPSH. He is the owner of the Rotec Company in Casablanca. He holds a doctorate degree in philosophy of peace and human rights from Academy of Universal Global Peace. Another doctorate degree in philosophy of peace and human rights from Academy of Security and Human Sciences. Dr. Mbaraki, your 15 minutes uh, starts now. Thank you very much. Uh... President, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cesar and Dr. Sao. It's a great pleasure to be uh, between you. You hear me, I guess. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes, we, we, we can hear you, Excellency. You may proceed. Then as I, as I talked with uh, Dr. Sara, then I will uh, present my, uh, my subject in French. 
Okay, then you can prepare to change the language. <laughs> Thank you. You may proceed, uh, Your Excellency. Alors, uh, salut tout le monde. Uh, salut mes chers intervenants, Monsieur le Président. Et merci aussi à l'organisme euh, organisateur de cet événement. Mais je vous savez très bien, d'après ce que vous avez cité à propos de moi, je travaille sur la paix et les droits de l'homme. Pourquoi la paix et les droits de l'homme Le monde a vraiment besoin de paix. Sinon, s'il n'y a pas de paix, il n'y a pas de stabilité, il n'y aurait pas de développement. Donc, il faut encourager les gens à être stables chacun dans son pays, afin qu'on puisse bâtir un monde meilleur pour tout le monde. On se rappelle très bien le, en 2011, lorsqu'il y avait ce qu'on appelait l'Arabic Spring, le, les, gens de, les peuples demandaient uniquement la stabilité parce qu'ils avaient peur de ne pas être stables. Ils ne pensaient pas au développement. Euh, le problème des jeunes actuels, surtout en Afrique, en particulier en Amérique latine, c'est le travail. Alors, c'est pourquoi en Afrique, avec des amis africains, on a créé une agence africaine de coopération et de développement afin qu'on puisse trouver des investisseurs partout dans le monde et leur présenter des opportunités africaines dans chaque pays dans chaque pays, nous aurons un directeur qui va nous présenter les opportunités de son pays et pour les présenter aussi aux investisseurs pour choisir chacun en ce qui le concerne. Dans le domaine de l'énergie, de l'eau, du bâtiment, de l'agriculture, etc. Donc, c'était ça le but de créer l'Agence africaine de coopération et de développement. Vous savez très bien, nous vivons aujourd'hui dans un monde qui a besoin de plus que jamais de paix et de stabilité. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut, par exemple, les dirigeants et les officiels euh, doivent contribuer à cette paix plus que d'autres sur le front intérieur, comme ils doivent écouter leur peuple qui aspire à une vie décente et à la dignité et les considérer comme des partenaires de paix et de stabilité et ne pas les considérer comme des ennemis. Il ne faut jamais considérer les peuples comme des ennemis. Ils doivent faire un coup d'oir et des amis du gouvernement pour les soutenir et mettre la main dans la main pour atteindre les objectifs de développement en général. Et c'est en partageant pour euh, d'ailleurs les richesses euh, des pays et en luttant contre la corruption pour renforcer leurs économies et s'engager dans un développement durable avec la participation du tout. Sur le front extérieur, euh, on remarque actuellement qu'il y a les haines qui prévaut entre les pays et qui doivent cesser malheureusement. Les guerres doivent cesser. Donner une chance aux négociations visant la paix internationale et les efforts pour faire face aux épidémies, surtout, et aux catastrophes naturelles, en particulier la pandémie COVID-19 qui a qui a avorté le, les progrès de l'économie internationale, de l'économie mondiale en général. Et avant-hier, on entendait dire euh, le président américain Joe Biden qui avait dit « on va demander plus d'argent pour faire face à la deuxième pandémie qui va venir ». Ça veut dire qu'ils sont au courant que le monde va encore accueillir une autre maladie. Dieu nous protège. Par rapport à la plupart des pays du Nord, les pays du Sud en particulier restent victimes de la mondialisation en raison de la division injuste des richesses et des privilèges, ce qui a montré le fossé économique entre les pays. 
des pays trop riches et des pays trop, trop pauvres. Tandis que la pauvreté et la fragilité, et la fragilité elles demeurent la part des pays du Sud, malheureusement. Cela a affecté négativement leur peuple. On sait très bien que, en l'absence presque générale de canons officiels, gouvernement, parlement, parti politique, syndicat, etc., et même les institutions de recours censées d'écouter les demandes des peuples et précipiter les solutions en fonction des capacités disponibles. Parce qu'il faut d'abord dissoudre les problèmes et les litiges entre les peuples et les gouvernements pour garantir une stabilité durable qui va donner un élan pour le développement et le progrès. C'est là où la profondeur de la crise et la perte de confiance entre les peuples et les gouvernements, il n'y aurait pas de développement. Et de plus, la base, le socle principal du développement, c'est les libertés. Les peuples doivent être libres, dire ce qu'ils ce qu'ils doivent dire d'ailleurs. Il n'y a pas de développement avec une répression. C'est là où réside le profondement de la crise et encourage la perte de confiance, comme j'ai dit, des citoyens, non seulement dans leur relation avec l'acteur politique, social ou économique, mais aussi dans toutes les institutions. Plusieurs exemples en général qui ne peuvent pas être évoqués faute de temps, et tout cela reflète une profonde crise sociale qui a atteint le point d'exode massif, malheureusement parfois à l'étranger, comme le FLIO aussi a abordé le sujet de la citoyenneté. Donc, euh, merci infiniment. Alors, euh, je peux dire que, à propos, même si ce n'est si pas mon domaine, à propos de l'eau et à propos des énergies, actuellement, il y a même les politiques qui dominent ça. Il y a la rareté de l'eau, il y a même des pays qui repoussent des nuages pour voler de la pluie, il y a même des, je ne sais pas moi, des, des énergies nouvelles de la nouvelle technologie comme le cobalt actuellement et le traçage des eaux, etc. Il y a, des litiges entre les pays. Donc, euh, on souhaite bien une paix générale pour une vie durable au globe humanitaire qui se trouve sur le globe terrestre. Merci infiniment et en attendant vos questions. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, um, for the presentation. Uh, it is most appreciated. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are happy. We have come to the end of the three uh, panelists that uh, presented to us. And I will open the floor to the particip to the audience to interact and ask questions where we need clarity uh, from our panelists. I see the hand of uh, Dr. Martha uh, Butler. You may take the floor. Okay, now the, the mic is open. Can you hear me? Oh, we, we, you, 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 you are dragging. Uh, I, 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 we can't hear you properly. Hello to everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. You may proceed. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, uh, Dr. Martha, you, can, you may proceed. OK. 
sorry, it's a, it's a, I'll, I'll write, I'll write in the chat the question. You may ask your question, uh, Dr. Martha. I think we are having a, a challenge there with the uh, Dr. Martha's network. Mm. Maybe you can restart uh, your, your network and we'll give you an opportunity uh, to ask. Is there anyone else? Well, let's maybe Dr. Martha uh, is sorting out a network. Uh, anyone who wants to ask a question or interact with our panelists? Yes, uh, Excellency uh, Gwen Patrick, you may take the floor. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciated the um, presentation by uh, uh, His Excellency Cesar Lopez. I uh, feel that it's extraordinary uh, that he's able to provide training uh, on the uh, sustainability uh, without chemicals, you know, in the organic farming arena. However, in the presentation, I was not clear in his uh, depiction of his site as to whether what the size of that site was. He mentioned a certain number of hectares, but I'm not sure I gathered that. That's number one. And number two, I'm wondering if he can provide uh, details of how we communicate with him, um, you know, for, for further communication and contact. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for those questions. Uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Lopez to respond. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we have in the Dominican Republic. This is interesting. We have we are the high the, we have the largest organic cocoa and bananas producing production in the world, exported to many countries, several countries. So we have actually this horticultural small plots, which is one, in my case, is one, one water of, a, of an hectare. It's a size that I can manage. And it's appropriate for small farmers that have even uh, small land. But the cacao, agroforestry system, organic cacao agroforestry system is uh, 10 hectares that we have. But we have farmers in the average, we have 30, 36,000 farmers, cocoa farmers, and the average size of the farms are three hectares. And the productivity is very low one, I mean, like 400 kilograms per hectare, while some organic or agroecological farmers produce up to two, two, two tons of organic cocoa per hectare. So this technology is appropriate for small, very small farmers and very large farmers. It doesn't matter. Of course, for large farmers, then you will have, uh, in some cases, the use of, uh, machinery, I mean, mechanical systems. In my case, I don't have any mechanical system because my farm and, and several of my friends, the, in this the geological uh, characteristic of the soils in this area have these stones, a large stone that you cannot even get out of the ground to, to, so to allow machinery to go in. So everything has to be by hand in a way that makes farmers less dependent on 
on energy machinery. But the good thing is that the production is not less because of that. In, and in the Dominican Republic, because we have low employment sources for rural areas, we can keep young farmers, young people close to the farmers. If we have pro high productivity or high benefits, if you don't have to exp expend a lot of money to produce large quantities. So we see this, as this me methodology as a strategy for rural development promotion and to keep young people in the rural areas. And this is, we're trying to do this through the university that I'm working for now. Uh, my, my, the way to communicate with me, I think you can get it from, uh, but it's, I have a, a C, C Lopez. Well, I don't know. I will, uh, Dr. Uh, I forgot this, your name. Uh, you can get it from the, from, from the leadership of the event because it is there. Thank you. That's fine. We will we'll, we'll forward the, the, the contacts to Dr. Gwen Patrick. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. You, you, yes. you be there. Maybe you'll get another question. Uh, Dr. Martha, uh, I hope you can now uh, speak. Dr. Martha? I think I'm not sure uh, what's happening with with her there. She's muted, I guess. Okay, I think I think I'm open now. Is the mic okay. open? Can you hear me? Hello. Can hear you. You may, you may proceed. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. No, it's a, it was muted, but I I'm glad it's open now. No, I I wanted Cesar Lopez to comment. Um, about, and he did a little bit, but I think he should comment more about the training experience that they had in the 90s with the support from the Swiss uh, here in the Dominican Republic where they trained, I don't know how many thousands small farmers to do organic agriculture. And the result of that is, as he was mentioning, that we are number one exporters of organic cacao and you know, used for the best chocolates in the world. And the same thing uh, with bananas, organic banana growth. And it's organic. So that means, you know, chemical things, pesticides or stuff like that. And the beautiful thing is that now since it has it on his own plot, show the world. I think that's beautiful, and I and I agree with with Ms. Gwen that we need to get his contact and and get you know other people in the area of agriculture in, in connection with him because I we are going to be facing a big food security situation in the world due to all these uh, climate change affecting uh, how food is produced in the world. And I'm, I'm glad whether this is good or bad, that we're getting back to the basics to do the way the Lord designed it to happen. Uh, so I would like Cesar to comment. Thank you. Well, uh, thank uh, you. okay. Yeah, you may proceed, uh, Dr. Lopez. Yes, uh, well, I have had parallel or in some cases, other time, full times, a very wide experience also in rural development with NGOs. Like I was six years, I was a direct national director of World Vision in the Dominican Republic, 1991 to 97 or so. And also other, organic, other NGOs promoting agroforestry as natural resource conservation and of biodiversity and so on. Uh, of course, until this crisis that we just came in the last two years or so different with climate change, because the same practices to, to make farms resilient to, uh, to climate change, to, to warm uh, 
global warming are the same agrophoric cover uh, all the time to keep to be, keep the land the surface cool and that will keep humidity and water infiltration because the life living organism in the soil keep the soil permeable when you plow the soil and compact the top then water instead of going into the land infiltrating it runs off and so you may once in the in an island like we have uh one hour after a big rain you will have uh, most of the water in the sea if you don't get the water infiltrate so this soil conservation and water conservation practices are similar at are included in the agroforestry uh, management of farms and of course the biomass since we have tropical conditions it is easier to obtain biomass all the time to recycle because this is like constructing a, a brick house and you if you can dismantle the house and get the bricks again you can make another house with the same material and this is this is how crops are and 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 biomass plants if you can if you can uh, through composting and other techniques mulching and so on you can uh, instead of burning there is no burning in agroforestry i mean in agro yeah agroecology because if you burn you you volatilize the nutrients like nitrogen and sulfur and so on so if if you recycle it you keep all those nutrients or most of them in the top of the soil feeding the crops that you are using and so all this technology is easier to promote them there has been some lack of support because the chemical industry doesn't like this technology we don't they don't want us to success now succeed but now because of the crisis now people are more open to to this approach but there is no need actually we don't all the soils have all the nutrients that we need and the 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 chemical the conventional agriculture sold to us in our training that the the most limiting factor for crop production is mineral and we have all the minerals in the soils they are not in the right chemical form so the, it is the microorganism the micro diversity of the flora in the soil and the microorganism that make those nutrients available when you burn or you add chemicals you destroy this diversity and so and you don't and then you have to apply and then it becomes more expensive and more contaminating and so on it's a, a vicious cycle of problems with this uh, approach you don't have to apply anything just you it is intensive in knowledge you need to know more and the farmers normally know the kind of crop that prosper better in their farm and so on so making sure the farmers share their different experience participatory approach to research and training is key for agroforestry and so we work with those approaches thank you very much for that elaborate uh, response that gives insight uh, into that into the quick uh, is there anyone else uh, who has a question or comment or wants to contribute something before we move on okay i don't see a hand there oh, sorry uh, is that a hand Uh, is that a legacy hand, uh, Dr. Martha and Dr. Oh, it's uh, a and real hand. It's a legacy hand. No, no, no. It's a real hand. <laughs> okay, thank you. You, you may, you may proceed. Okay, no, I, I just want to. I mean, it's such a privilege to have these awesome speakers, and and just being able to have nailed Cesar to speak for us. Uh, this is a very particular guy, you know, <laughs> so I, I'm happy that he's been able to share some of his knowledge. I, one of the things that I, I find very interesting of everything they do is 
was saying of it's simple. It's the are around that are shedding leaves all the time and you can use them into that whatever they call it, compost, mulch, whatever. I just think it's beautiful because it takes us back in Gandawa to the basics. And in a time where all these chemicals are so costly, and not only the cost of the implication of buying the chemicals, it's how costly they are when we eat all this food that is contaminated by these chemicals, we're all getting sick and we have more cancer now than we ever had before. And we have more diabetes. I don't know in the rest of the world, but in the Dominican Republic, we have almost 12% of the adult population is already diabetic. We are having a major health problem here. If we can change the agriculture practices and you know, make it in a sustainable way, we're gonna be able to avoid a number of other problems especially the health ones that are the ones I'm most concerned with. There's also the social ones that we're avoiding. It's like what Cesar was saying, if we can put these practices in place and we get the young people to stay, because they're going to be able to make money, okay, even if they stay in these rural areas, you know, we're gaining something that's very important. It's we are, we are making development continue in the rural areas. And we're avoiding all these ghettos that we have in the major cities of young people that are just hanging around because they have nothing to do, no jobs, no nothing, and just getting into drugs and drug trafficking. So it's a, it's a virtuous cycle if we can engage in this kind of practice and, and improve the development of our rural areas. So I don't know, I think we need to bring this to a more high level of political decisions in each one of our countries. That's just another comment. Thank you. Uh, thank and you, I, love, thank you. I love the lady speaker. I will connect with her <laughs> because thank you. I, thank I, you, I loved her exposition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Excellency uh, Gwen Patrick, is that Elie Gassiand or you want to say something? Yes, I just wanted to uh, reemphasize the importance, I think, and that's why I wanted to know the sizing, you know, of the of the sites, you know, how many hectares, because again, uh, just as Madame Martha uh, just spoke, uh, this is an incredible opportunity for uh, small farmers to really uh, take advantage, not only of the need and the necessity for food security, but to also be able to, I think and hope, and which leads to my next question, whether he has processing, food processing as an offshoot of the successful farming. And, and once again, I would love to be in further communication with you, but on my end, the chat feature uh, is not uh, operative, you know, right now. But if you could provide a, a clearer indication of how I may continue uh, in collaboration and correspondence with you. Again, I'm in the United States, and frequently we have so many requests for entrepreneurs in an agricultural uh, type of project, but they want to rely upon the chemically based, you know, uh, growth and farming that that is so powerful and frequent here in the United States. And so to hear you expound in, in incredible ways of the, the unnecessary uh, you know, chemical fertilizers and other type of, 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 of interactions to sustain those crops. I, I really want to know more about that. But again, I also want to know in your comments, have you had conversation with production after those crops? you know, have been, you know, beautifully grown. Is there a production uh, side of this that you could speak to as well? And I thank you, I, I, I give you the floor and I thank you. Thank you, uh, Excellency Gwen Patrick. Uh, Dr. Lopez, you may respond. Thank you, thank you. We are open all my life. My father was a pastor, so since I was, I can't remember since I was so small, 
servicing other people is part of my life. So I enjoy that. Of course, uh, transform, transforming basic new, uh, production into more uh, chain value along the chain value uh, line is ideal. Uh, right now, I'm involved in research and, and training at the university. But uh, I'm looking forward to, to having uh, this farm converted into a training place where a small farmer can come and, and learn and practice and go and then follow up in their own farms and so that this can be expanded because I see no need, no reason why we, can, we should have hunger. Because with this technology and seeds and some simple tools, you can produce food and be resilient to climate change. This is the great part. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, have, I have not had support. I have asked, uh, tried to, to establish this, but has had little support. But uh, is there are volunteers, this idea of having volunteers from the US or whatever uh, other countries into with uh, maybe a sabbatical or that can come and help us develop, uh, for, for example, for us, it's very expensive uh, to import uh, soybean and, and corn for, for eggs and ch uh, chicken production. So it would be interesting to, to help us uh, develop a simple industry of making flowers of root crops like cassava, yams, bananas, sweet potatoes to feed animals or people, people and animals, because we need protein. To, to substitute this imported uh, protein, most of our eggs and chicken are very expensive because of that. So we need to, to include not only primary production, but also animals and, and then maybe in some in, industrial chocolate. We, it, it, we export uh, raw cocoa, very cheap, relatively cheap, and then we have to import chocolate, the sophisticated uh, product that are more, much, much more expensive. But this is a complicated, I mean, as, as you heard, I, I, graduated, I graduated from Texas A&M, I am an Aggie, in 1971. So <laughs> I've been living a long time. I want to take it easy, <laughs> but, but I'm willing to, to participate with other groups in in this, that's why I like what you are doing in this organization to promote uh, a better world with everybody and and eat nutritionally and healthy. And so I'm I'm available to cooperate with any uh, process. Uh, it's very difficult for me to lead <laughs> more than what I'm doing now, but participate yes with uh, initiatives that can come. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as we we close, there are no more questions there. So what I will do, I will give um, Excellency Sagarika some two minutes to give a, a final remarks uh, or sum up um, a presentation or conversation. Then I will come to Dr. Um, Barak. Then. Uh, Dr. Lopez, you, you will give us your final uh, words or remarks. Dr. Sagarika, uh, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, first of all. Um, I feel that, yes, when the topic came to me on uh, how science and breakthroughs would help in every sector, like as I mentioned, the four important pillars, in every sector, I feel there is sustainable uh, ideas available out there. Some of them are groundbreaking from the local people and uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Lopez shares a lot of experience in that, as well as some come from the government side. And if both mix hands together, I'm sure every country can have their food security, have their water security, climate, as well as everything. And uh, coming together is more important. And uh, what is lovely also is knowledge exchange. And that is the key. And if you can create more such events and workshops and trainings, 
I think that would help, you know, uh, the developing countries adding more to the developed countries and all meeting together and actually talking about their experiences. And if this can be duplicated in different countries, I think it will create a good ripple effect. So I wish all of you all the very best. And if there are any support you need from my side, I'll just add my contact details. I'm more than happy to step in because I do work for the Dubai government also. I worked with DP World for three and a half years and the DIFC Authority for six and a half years. So more than happy to get my experience and expertise into this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is most appreciated. Um, we thank you so much for the great work and the remarks that you've given us and your openness you know, to continue to contribute and work with us. It is most appreciated. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, uh, your two, three minutes to wrap up and give us your final comments. Oui, ben, je, je vous remercie très bien et je suis très heureux parce que j'ai fait, d'ailleurs j'ai entendu les interventions des, des, des intervenants de M. Dr. Lopez et Dr. Sao, c'est vraiment intéressant pour les pays qui cherchent à trouver un modèle pour le développement. Donc, c'est tout court dans cette phrase-là. Ce qu'il faut, c'est de creuser dans le monde pour trouver des gens qui ont des connaissances, des expériences, car, car malheureusement, nos jeunes d'actuel, ils perdent beaucoup d'occasions d'aller courir après les énergies, après les, 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 des expériences et des... Je dis bien des gens qui ont bien travaillé et ficelé les choses depuis des années et qui ont des expériences et peuvent donner des leçons pour l'avenir. Donc, c'est ce qui manque pour nos jeunes actuellement. Je demande à la jeunesse africaine de faire la conquête du monde et trouver, courir après les nouveaux modèles de développement, les nouveaux modèles d'éthique, les nouveaux modèles de l'essentiel, c'est pour bâtir et les mains dans la main pour un monde meilleur pour nous tous. Et nos enfants. Merci infiniment, Monsieur le Président, et je vous souhaite plein succès pour le prochain rendez-vous, la prochaine conférence. Merci à tous et à toutes, et à la prochaine. Merci. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mbarak, for that, uh, um, for those remarks. It's true. Uh, that the, the youth uh, of today and the youth in Africa uh, need to uh, engage and learn, take these opportunities uh, that come about to develop themselves as well as develop the communities that they, uh, they live in uh, so that we are food secure. Thank you so much. Uh, we hope to engage with you uh, again in future uh, to give us your experience and the expertise that you, uh, you have shown us. Thank you very much. Uh, I come to Dr. Lopez to give your final remarks in two to three minutes. Um, Excellency. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I have enjoyed participating. Thank you for your invitation and openness to so that to share what we can, we see. We have a vision to uh, a better world, and there are so many problems that it's difficult sometimes to think that it's possible, but. We need to, to have faith that when goodwill and uh, healthy food, that's good, that's needed. So I, I feel good when I promote healthy food, which are, is now the specialists talk about one health. It, the conditions for, for human health, good sustainable human health are the same for good sustainable animal health, plant health, microbial health, so we need to, uh, to reduce these chemicals that cause so much uh, problems and contamination. There are more than 140,000 new chemicals since the war finish of the end of World War II that have come into, into our system. So, and, and actually much of them, most of them are not really needed and they are released without really testing what are all the consequences. 
of, of in the, not only in, in the place where they are used, but after that. I mean, we, need, we should know the life cycle. They, they, we should know the life cycle during the whole initial and end of a product and see all the implications. Fortunately, agroecology, which was what was practiced originally, I mean, 100 years ago when we didn't have chemicals, uh, it was a natural process that was implemented. And we can go back to those very simple with very low cost, mostly training is what we need to, to rescue those practices that are even today in, in all societies that have not been disturbed. They keep <clears throat> very sustainable food production practices. But we have done a lot of damage, all this ex, uh, excess burning of fuels, of uh, uh, geological store fuels like petroleum products are, unfortunately, they have, these are the causing this warming in, in the, and in has disturbed the, the disturbance of the climate. And then when you have trees, a, a diverse a number of trees, if you can, there are the Celtic area, but there are interesting projects now where even deserts are being rescued by simple practices. So there is hope, I have hope. And I think uh, if we all come together with the same willingness to do what is known to, to prosper and be sustainable, we need to establish models that, that those that are willing also to, to, to do their part, we come together and, and do it. So we will have many, many models and we can do that in, in food production, in the tropics, and whatever. So I'm. Um, thank you for. We invite everybody to practice recycle instead of burning or deforesting, and we will have more water, more energy, and so on. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for those remarks. Uh, definitely, we will uh, continue to engage and learn from your experience. Uh, thank you very much. We move on as we move towards the close. I want to go to South Africa and ask um, uh, my colleague, uh, Master Charles Kud, to take the offering. Your Excellency. Excellency Charles. Do I see? Excellency Chow? I think, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. You may, you may proceed. Yes. There we go. Sorry, my microphone was was uh, not unlocked. So there we go. I'm I'm glad that you can hear me. Thank you so much. Um, I have the uh, privilege of just sharing a little bit about uh, our um, our offering. And as you can see there with the GFFJ uh, details, it's uh, sometimes always an awkward thing. One would say is you know why do we always have to talk about money? Uh, you know, and I, I've always never understood that growing up in the church and growing up with what is happening. And I, I realize that as we are talking right now at my particular place where we are, we have got load shedding and it's completely dark. And um, I'm here with a little spotlight and, and, and uh, trying to see. And I thought that that was a beautiful analogy that God is sharing, uh, sharing with me as I was listening to our esteemed guests, that the world is in darkness. The world, there needs a light to be shone uh, into very dark spaces. And the people that are on this call and those people who will be listening and viewing this um, have the answer. We have the answer to be able to, to shed the light into dark spaces with a solution that God has given us. And at GBR GFFJ, we do believe that, that God has given us a vehicle to be able to bring light into dark spaces. 
for me, I'm sure in today's society, people are very careful about how they spend their money and what they are spending it on. I was taught that one should be a good steward of God's resources, and that's true. But not everyone has the luxury to give vast amounts of money. And so I thought that you needed a lot of money in order to give. And I was very wrong in my assumption. In time, I was taught that we can be generous in either of the following ways. It is called the three T's. Either given our time, our talent, or our treasure. This evening, we've, we've heard how people have given of their, their time, of their talent, and how they give of their treasure. And this got to me. This three T's meant that I didn't have an excuse not to be generous anymore. Personally, I found that in certain areas, I was quite comfortable to give, but in other areas, it was quite challenging. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that when I had difficulty giving, I was relying on my own strength to provide for myself. I was not relying on God to be my provider. I was my provider. And with it came a lot of stress. I had treated my finances as a commodity I needed to control and not a kingdom resource that needed to be stewarded. God's word said that we can't serve God and mammon. Mammon in this case means self-reliance, me, the provider. And God revealed to me that giving was a condition of my heart. Was Christ really Lord of my life? Was he really the CEO of all I own? I will be honest, from time to time, I still am ch challenged uh, to completely let go of control. So this evening's motivation is a call to self-reflection and self-inspection to move away from self-reliance. Matthew 6 verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How do we spend with our hearts? Well, for those of you who are like me, when I was courting my wife, I would travel long distances, distances just to be with her, write beautiful poems, and I would use half of my measly salary to buy her flowers and take her out for a movie. The three T's were working overtime. I was spending time with her, uh, my talent, even though I wasn't a great poet, and my treasure, my pocket turned towards the call of my heart. Giving is a matter of the heart. And this evening, what you've heard from our three, eight, three experts is that there is a need and that in us is the solution that we can bring to the world. Deuteronomy 15 says, in any of the towns in your land, the Lord your God is giving you. If there is anyone poor among you, do not let your heart be hard and not be willing to help him. Be free to give to him. Let him use what is yours of anything he needs. This, these are powerful scriptures. And we read that uh, the Bible mentions money over 800 times. There's uh, plus minus 2,300 Bible verses about money. And we know that uh, money is an important topic that God speaks of in the word of God which means that when he's talking about money, he's actually talking about our heart. Through GFFJ, you will find many doorways to discover a space where your heart may find peace in being generous, a space to honor God with your wealth, no matter how small or big. So you can find uh, the banking details on the screen, uh, or more importantly, we would like to pray with you in hearing the voice of God regarding your heart and where he wants you to use or where he wants to use you more as his heart and his hands. If we can just uh, bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these beautiful people that have spent their time to be on this call. Father, you see their hearts. They have been giving already into fertile soil. Father, with their intentions, their heart, their talent, their time, I pray, Father, that you will just entrust these beautiful people with more resources, influence, Father, uh, money, property, whatever it might be, Father, that we can expand your kingdom and we can be a light in the darkness. I thank you, Father, and those who are giving into this account, Lord, I pray that you will multiply the resources in GFFJ, but also those who are giving, that you will multiply and grow them 
as you grow their hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, um, Excellency uh, Chalkud, for taking the offering and for that uh, prayer. Uh, we're blessed. Uh, as we move on, I, I uh, go again to South Africa and ask um, Excellency Tato Mashal to give us announcements and vote thanks. Yes, uh, good after, good evening. <laughs> Sorry, I, I nearly said good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. And uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kandawa, for the opportunity to read the announcements today and to give gratitude to your speakers and participants. So the announcements are as follows. The next GBR international session will be held uh, next Thursday, the 30th, uh, from 7 to 9. Uh, CAT, on, and it will take place on the Zoom. Uh, you can watch all the previous GBR international sessions online uh, on the GBR website, www.globalbusinessroundtable.com and also on YouTube. You are invited to register in the Global Business Roundtable network by accessing the GBR website, www.globalbusinessroundtable.com and GBR and GFFJ leadership requests or GBR members and GFFJ ambassadors to set aside every Wednesday from six to six, from January to November as a day of prayer and, fast, and fasting. We are also invited to join the GBR 24 hour prayer network. For more information on how to join and be allocated a slot, kindly contact Pastor Carol Paulson at carol at globalbusinessroundtable.com or Madam Siska Adamson on siska at globalbusinessroundtable.com. I'd like to take this opportunity to give credit and gratitude to all our participants, especially our, uh, our uh, guest speakers today. Uh, first and foremost, we'd like to thank Dr. Godfrey Kanwawa for doing a great uh, job of uh, facilitating this, uh, this session. Uh, we appreciate you and we, you did very well. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Madam Ronaldo Mley from all the way from Tanzania for doing the opening prayer. And also, would like to thank uh, our speakers today, uh, Dr. Cesar Lopez, uh, Ms. Uh, Sagarita Sawu, and Dr. Mbarek Afe Ko uh, for the sterling presentations. Uh, we hope to see you again. And also, would like to uh, thank uh, Master Shao Kut, uh, also my colleague. Uh, for conducting the uh, offering for us tonight. And I uh, would like to thank in advance, uh, as we anticipate Pastor Oliver Tomi Banji as he's going to be uh, closing in a word of prayer for us. And lastly, we'd like to thank everybody that has attended the session today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Dr. Gandam. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Excellency uh, Tato Mashal, for uh, the announcements and for thanking everybody. Actually, you were not wrong when you said uh, good afternoon uh, because uh, Dr. Lopez there must be in the afternoon actually. So he did both good afternoon and good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for thanking everybody and giving those announcements. Uh, as we close, uh, we ask, uh, uh, we also want to thank the technical team for the great work that they've done uh, to sustain us uh, you know, on this program. Uh, we ask uh, Pastor Oluwatuma Obayanji from Nigeria to close the session for us. Uh, Excellency uh, Pastor Oluwatuma. Okay, thank you, Excellency, for, for the privilege and thank you for the success of tonight's meeting. Let us pray. Precious Father, we, we thank you for this day. We give you all the praise. We are grateful for all that you have done in this gathering tonight. We ask that your name alone be exalted, your name be glorified. As we go tonight, we go in your name, we go in your power, we go in your grace. Let the blessing of tonight's meeting rest upon us abundantly. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for participating and uh, being a part of this uh, session. 
Uh, be blessed and we meet next week uh, on Thursday, uh, same time, uh, seven o'clock to nine o'clock. Uh, be blessed and bye.